Hello, everybody, and good morning. Uh, I'm Corinna Hurst, president of the Brussels Binder, as well as senior fellow and deputy director at the German Marshall Fund office in Brussels. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to today's event. This event is the first in a series which we are doing to conclude the EU funded project Brussels Binder Beyond. The German Marshall Fund, the Brussels Binder and the think tank Bruegel as consortium partners have been working for the last two years to share the story and experience of the Brussels Binder, the first publicly available database of women policy experts to create more databases in Europe and develop practical tools, uh, tools and networks to make it possible that more women can be visible in policy debates and in the media commenting on policy shaping and making. However, in this process, the Brussels Binder as an organization itself has become aware of the need to reflect on how well we as an organization are doing on diversity, equity and inclusion and today at the first anniversary of George Floyd really provides a fitting moment to elevate this discussion also on a European sort of level. And the European Union plays a crucial role in raising awareness about policy issues in that realm, as well as opportunities. And the European Commission itself is instrumental in setting agendas and proposing guidelines. And it's no different with when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion. So we're really thrilled uh, that Commissioner Dali has agreed to join us today in the framework of the European Union's Diversity Month to provide some introductory remarks before we then move to our panel discussion for a deeper uh, dive onto where Europe is when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion. So Commissioner Dali, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. And good afternoon. And as you say, this event is, is very timely, as, as it is also the, the first anniversary uh, of the killing of George Floyd, as you say. Uh, but also because on the one hand, we are marking the end of the funding period for, for the project. And on the other hand, we are celebrating the launch of the biggest budget the EU has ever head to support fundamental rights and equality in, in Europe. So the allocation for the next seven years totals 1.55 billion euros. And the amount of funding that European institutions have set aside to protect and enhance our, our shared values as European citizens boldly affirms the committed to, to, to progress of the European project, the commitment to progress of the European project. This budget will go towards turning the, the policies we have proposed since the beginning of the current Commission's mandate into reality. So the European Democracy Action Plan, the Gender Equality Strategy, the Anti-Racism Action Plan, the Roma Strategic Framework, the LGBTIQ equality strategy, the strategy for the rights of persons with disabilities, and the strategy currently in preparation on combating anti-Semitism and, and fostering Jewish life. As calls for proposals are now open, the Brussels binder beyond the project should serve as an inspiration to others in terms of what can be achieved. You have successfully brought together over 80 like-minded organizations and think tanks and have one of the most valuable databases of experts in Europe today. I hope that you keep this work up and keep inspiring others. As a civil society organization, you are also an excellent example of the power of community. It is exactly this that can unify at a time of polarization. In fact, the European Parliament and Council actually chose to increase the budget for the Citizens Equality Rights and Values Programme we are launching today by over 900 million euros. This is our own recognition of the need to strengthen and support civil society organizations at a time 
when their effort and insights are needed the most. Meanwhile, the EU's institutions must continue to stand strong when the values of our citizens are challenged. Symbols matter because they show what we stand for. For instance, the European Parliament's declaration of the EU as an LGBTIQ freedom zone was an important political stance. As Mr. Bodnar said during an event we both spoke at in Warsaw this month, public statements such as this make others realize where, that, where the right side of history is. But it is true that even the best resolutions cannot re replace legal measures where the EU has competence. So I can assure you that the Commission will be proposing legislation wherever we need it to protect our citizens. Later this year, for instance, we will be proposing the, uh, the addition of hate speech and hate crime to the list of EU crimes, including when directed at LGBTIQ people. We will also be putting forward legislation to fight gender-based violence while we try and remove the obstacles to the EU's accession to the Istanbul Convention. In the meantime, the Commission will keep funding the work of civil society organizations working in the areas of fundamental rights and equality. The deadline for applications for the first call for proposals is the 15th of June, and I urge all of you who are interested to apply. I thank you. Wonderful. Well, Commissioner, thank you so much for your remarks. I, I think that uh, that really gives us a nice jumping off point um, for our panel discussion here today. It's wonderful for you to, uh, to make time for us. And uh, I'm very much looking for, forward to our discussion. Um, and I'm Anna Mulrang-Groby, and I'm delighted to be moderating this wonderful panel on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the EU. Um, it's especially an honor because, as we said, to be kicking off this series of events to commemorate the wonderful work that the Brussels Binder Beyond Project has done these past years. Uh, so it's one of a, a series of great events that's going to be taking place over the course of the week, um, along with partners at the German Marshall Fund. And yeah, the point of their good work has really been centered on finding practical solutions uh, moving forward and uh, best practices. And I'm looking forward to exploring all of these uh, in the realm of DE&I with all of you today, particularly since we have such a great panel uh, to discuss all of this with. Um, so joining us today, we have Adam Bodnar, uh, the outgoing human rights commissioner uh, or ombudsman for Poland. Uh, and he is has been has been outspoken in his criticism of his country's actions on the DEI front. Uh, so it'll be wonderful to have his views today. He's also a 2013 Marshall Memorial Fellow. Um, we also have uh, hopefully joining us Pierku Malmaki, uh, the Executive Committee Member for the European Disability Forum. Uh, Priscilla Panu Panu, uh, who is on the cabinet of Commissioner Dali and should be able to give us some nice insights there as well. So we're looking forward to those. And finally, Alfea Zvaya, uh, the co-founder of the Equinox Racial Justice Initiative. And he's also testified before the US Congress and is a 2019 Marshall Memorial Fellow. So we've got really a wonderful, wonderful panel here today. And, and I think a nice jumping off point, having just heard Commissioner Dolly's remarks, uh, is to get a reaction from, from all of you on, on these. You know, we've heard about uh, uh, hate speech and crime, adding those to the list of crimes that are going to be uh, within the EU purview. Uh, yeah, let's let's start with uh, Afias and, uh, and we can move on from there. What did, what did you think of the commissioner's remarks? Thank you very much. Um, I was, very happy with the commissioner's remarks. And actually, I think we have to give credit to the commissioner, um, also President von der Leyen, for their work um, in combating uh, racism and also promoting equality. I think it's the first time we have a European Commission leadership, political leadership that is so engaged on the issue, and especially with a commissioner for equality, but a commissioner whose track record has been so outstanding in the past. Um, and I know Priscilla is here as well. Um, and I know Priscilla's also been doing good work along with others. So 
very good in that sense. Also, I have to say thank you to the GMF uh, for also giving me the MMF fellowship, but also, you know, being engaged in the network uh, and the Brussels binder. Now, just a very quick uh, comment on the commissioner's statement. I would say that there's been a maturity in the conversation. We've got that political leadership. We're moving away from this focus on individual acts and focusing on structural institutions and historical racism, at least from the racial perspective. And that is a big, big change at the fact that the European level we're talking about institutional structural and historical racism and from the president herself and the commissioner and others. So for us, there's a, a lot of good things happening. The only thing I would say in, in reaction to the commissioner's statement in probably a net more negative way is that, you know, we still have a long way to go to move away from this individual focus. The commissioner talks about hate crime and hate speech. We need to deal with that, but that also deflects us from tackling the big issues. If you look at climate change, you know, people talk about um, changing the demographics and impact of, you know, rising uh, population, but that's all about the individual. We need to focus more on like, how do we tackle structures and institutions that, you know, um, affect the climate crisis or in terms of gender, you know, we talk about boardroom equality, but that doesn't deal with gender inequality in the sense of, you know, how is that useful in one sense for women who are asylum seekers or trans women or trans sex workers. So we need to still have a more of a holistic approach of how discrimination works. And then the final thing I would say, and the commissioner said, you know, time of polarization. And I think we're seeing this across. We saw this on the other side of the Atlantic. It's here, but it's happening in South America. It's happening in, in the Asian uh, subcontinent. We have to tackle this time of polarization. But the only way we can do that is if we're consistent. And the only way we can be consistent is that we always call out the backsliding. And, you know, we have Adam today from Poland. Um, but we will only be consistent if we have for example, you know, we speak out when it's happening in Poland and in Hungary, but when it's happening in France and Denmark. And I would say, you know, the leaders in, in Poland and, and Hungary are fascist and racist. But if you see what's happening in France and this era of McCarthyism in France, of this attack on anyone supporting Muslims, it is equally as bad as what's happening in Denmark. And this is where I'll probably end, is that you have a prime minister from a social democrat party that has said openly that my goal and aim is to have zero asylum seekers. They have two types of laws, depending on which communities and neighborhoods you live in. So all I would say is that we're making good progress at the EU level, but the commission has to be firm with the member states like France and Denmark. We can't show, we can't be favoritizing particular member states. And I think if we do, what, it will, what will happen, will make life difficult for LGBTI people and women, for example, in, in Central and Eastern Europe, in Hungary and Poland, because they, because those governments, you know, will see it as the EU picking and choosing, depending on you know favoritism and, and strategy. So what I would say is that we just got to be consistent and always call out racism and fascism, um, and it is a time of polarization and a time of worrying backsliding. Uh, thank you. That that's uh, that's a great place to start. And and Adam, I'd love to get your thoughts now as well. Um, just for our audience's context, uh, you've said in the past that while the EU executive's response on the DEI front have resulted in positive changes uh, in Poland in the past, since 2019, you get the sense that there's been, as you described it, um, and I'll quote you here, this constant search for a supposed compromise, consensus, and dialogue, which hasn't really accomplished anything. So do you still feel this is the case? Uh, does anything you've heard today or this during your, your previous panel with uh, Minister Dolly change, change your mind in this regard? Um, my, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Uh, my comment was more about rule of law, uh, I would say, uh, than just uh, diversity, inclusion, and equi uh, equity. Uh, because when it comes to judicial independence, I think you know the commission may do more simply. Uh, when it comes to Poland. But, uh, but in this context of today's conversation, I would like just to concentrate on those uh, issues and points that the Commission may do in order to strengthen the capability and the, and the power to act within this frame. Uh, I, I'm a lawyer and I do believe in the value the of regulation, uh, in, in, in the value the of... It seems it's not me. Uh, in the value of regulation and in the value of uh, legal provisions and institutions. And, and just let me give you uh, a couple of points. So first of all, in every EU member state, uh, the institution which, which should be responsible for 
fighting with uh, discrimination due to different grounds should be so-called equality body. And uh, the EU anti-discrimination directives provide for, uh, uh, for the need to create that kind of equality body, which could be different institutions. In my country, it is at the same time national human rights institution. So basically I perform the function of both ombudsman and the equality body. But what, is, what may happen and what could be regulated is strengthening the institutional independence of equality body. And moreover, the commission has the power to do it because under article 19, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, it is quite, you know, it is the question of regulating it properly and then uh, asking member states uh, to implement a specific directive on the independence of equality body. And if you have an independent, specialized organ on the ground, then it's always better, believe me, to support any issues concerning non um, uh, discrimination or anti discrimination uh, policies. The second point. Uh, which should be, in, in my opinion, a little bit of a, uh, of a guilt on the part of the European Union, is lack of so-called horizontal uh, EU anti-discrimination directive. Uh, so please note, if you look right now into the whole uh, scope of the EU anti-discrimination law, it covers number of grants for discrimination, a number of social situations, uh, when where the discrimination may happen, but not all of them are covered there. Like, for example, if you have a person with disability who is restricted in access to goods and services that are publicly offered, this person cannot be protected under the EU law. You know, it could be protected if the member state provides for a comprehensive protection, but not all member states provide for that protection. Uh, and basically, the European Union perfectly knows that it is like a missing puzzle in this whole EU anti-discrimination uh, laws, but basically this puzzle is not completed, uh, starting from 2008. So in 2008, we had the first draft of horizontal directive, and until today, no directive like this has been uh, uh, adopted. Uh, the third point is, uh, and here I see a very important and good development, I would like to say, is support to NGOs on ra awareness raising, on strategic litigation, on advocacy actions. And just recently, the new fund has been established, so-called Rights and Values Fund, with the budget of 1.5 billion euro. And I think that is a good step because it might give a lot of money to uh, organizations, especially in those countries where you are observing so-called shrinking space for civil society. So like Poland, Hungary, maybe right now, Slovenia also, but also some other countries where that kind of issues are suffering because of polarization, because of the politics of identity, and because there is no proper sufficient funding for uh, NGOs dealing with protection against discrimination due to different grants. You know, it's quite interesting that in my country, for example, it is much easier to get money from Norwegian funds than from EU funds for that kind of cause. And thanks to the Rights and Values Fund, maybe uh, something may, may change. And, uh, and final point, uh, I see uh, one important uh, element of this fight uh, for uh, equality uh, is suddenly, you know, it's uh, not only raising awareness, but also fighting against hate speech uh, and in general hate phenomenon. And I see here that the adoption of the digital services package might be an important step in this direction because uh, this uh, package is providing for a comprehensive obligations on part of social media to protect against uh, hate speech and transfer of hate speech via uh, social media. In my opinion, it's important because most of the hate speech appears there, and then it has consequence on our um, uh, social uh, living. So I think that uh, it could be like something a little bit like the indirect way of harmonizing some aspects of the hate speech, especially in those countries when you do not have uh, sufficient um, uh, provisions. So, so in my opinion, you know, not even you know mentioning like specifically the situation in my country, uh, I think the European Union, Union has a lot of additional things to do in order to uh, to create much more positive landscape uh, and to protect equality and non-discrimination even more. Thank you very much. Unmuted now. Wonderful. Thank you for those thoughts. And Priscilla Panu Panu, turning to you, I'd love to get your thoughts just on, on all the comments that, uh, not every single one, but what struck you about what we're hearing from uh, <laughs> from Adam and Alfaez so far. 
I mean, it will be very, very difficult to uh, to reply to everything that that, that was mentioned, uh, of course. But um, I will just go back to you know, as the commissioner said, this event uh, is happening at a very uh, timely moment. It's one year to the day since a tragic event in Minneapolis uh, shocked the entire world and made us all have more concrete and difficult conversations about uh, racism, discrimination, intolerance, and how diversity and inclusion um, can be used to uh, to combat these in a mo more holistic and concrete way. And since then, we've seen uh, our mandate grow from the adoption of the European Democracy Action Plan, the Anti-Racism Action Plan, the Roma Strategic Framework, the LGBTIQ Equality Strategy, the Strategy for Rights uh, of the Persons with Disabilities, um, and the upcoming and currently being prepared, um, the uh, uh, strategy on combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life, but also the allocated funds to making all of this in, uh, into a, a concrete reality. We're really in a pivotal moment. Um, uh, I Taking all of these comments uh, on board, we're noting all of, uh, all of these down, but we're really in a concrete moment where the Commission is taking these conversations um, very seriously and moving forward. Wonderful. Okay, well, good. It's a, it's a nice start to our discussion. Uh, and I'd love to take it a step further. Uh, Brussels binder. We're, we're very interested in practical solutions, of course. Uh, so I'm curious for you all about what role you see civil society groups like Brussels binder, uh, as well as your own organizations um, and the private sector playing in building a more diverse, equitable and inclusive Europe. And Alphias, maybe we'll start with you and take it from there. It's a very good question, actually. And I think, you know, uh, we have to find out the different roles that everyone has to play. And so I think part of this attack with the polarization and, and things like this in Europe is we need to gain people's trust back at all levels, from the global, the national, and the, and the local level. And we saw um, how important, you know, the city level and the local councils have become. I think in the US, you know, that was already, uh, it's obvious that, you know, you have uh, elections for school governors to, you know, the local funding board for the school. And I think in Europe, we always focus on a very high level of politics, rather than, you know, looking at all levels of politics. And I think now we're seeing the change really happens from at, at, the, at all levels, but we need to invest more at a local level. And for that, we need to bring in different partners. Um, so, you know, we need to bring in civil society, corporations, and uh, government together. And, and COVID is a good example of this because um, at least in my country in the, in the UK, when we had the, the first lockdown, it was really civil society and the trade unions who came to the government and said, hey, we need to put in some sort of scheme to, to support people in their work, you know? So people were being um, laid off. So the furlough scheme came as a result of civil society and, um, and, and um, civil society pressuring the government with the trade unions. And likewise, we saw the business community respond and say, this is exactly what we need. And then if you go forward now with the vaccine rollout, you see how, you know, government working with a multinational corporation like the, the pharmaceutical companies, um, working together to work, to get an effective vaccine and then to roll it out, which required community support, civil society support to target the groups at most at risk and stuff. We can see the power of these groups working together, but what we need to see also is more transparency in how these relationships work. We also need to see a better focus on uh, civil society. Sometimes I feel like we're too, we're too focused on the corporate world and not enough on civil society. So I think, you know, that's what we need to be looking at. And then in terms of that transparency, we also need to see how public money is being used in, in these discussions and how much of a public good we're getting. So I feel like there's a very strong uh, relationship that we can build together. Um, COVID has shown us, you know, why we need and how we create resilient societies is by all of these different groups working together. Um, and we also realized, and that's probably where I end, is that complex challenges can't be uh, solved or tackled by one actor. You know, um, 
you need a changing constellation of state and non-state actors working in different formats at different times to solve complex challenges. And I think that's the one thing that I'm seeing now as, as, as a reason to be optimistic is how we can bring the different groups together and you know, see how we can deliver change and those accelerators that will make our society better. And I think this also goes to the point of Adam is that across Europe, we're seeing you know, shrinking safe space for civil society. And I feel that from the commission, we need to see even more support for civil society, not just financial support, because of course financial support is great, but we need genuine support in terms of political support, um, protecting civil society, whether again that happens in Hungary or in Poland, or we saw in France with the CCIF being closed down as part of this, what I would say is this McCarthyism in relation to Islam in France, we need the commission to always call out um, the shrinking space for civil society. And sorry, where I will end, here and I'll show why that can be so problematic is I think maybe six weeks ago you had the French Minister of Interior ask the EU not to disperse funding for a group um, who were who had met the requirements of the EU funding proposal on anti-Muslim hatred but the Minister of Interior had said that you know these groups who are working in who are working to combat Islamophobia are going against the values and actually a threat to the French state. And so what we need is to see the EU really speak out because what's happening at a national level is slowly coming to the European level. And I think this has happened on LGBTI rights, where we see the pressure from the national level now coming on to the independence of EU funding. So there's a lot of work we can work to that support. Great. Great. Now Priscilla, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this front. Ah, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Apologies, I always have uh, issues with uh, the mute button. Um, no, some some very concrete points made by by Alpheus, and yeah, thank you for for those. And of course, yes, uh, civil society plays uh, an incredibly important role. Uh, you know, as a source of information for citizens, for governments and for institutions alike, but also in monitoring policies and, ac and actions and, of course, in holding us accountable when we fail them. Um, and this is why the, the, the European Commission is in con constant contact with civil society. Um, we're there to listen carefully to proposals, to ideas and also to uh, criticisms wherever they're made directly uh, from the organizations or from their members. And this is uh, a way to ensure that specific concerns uh, are addressed and taken on board when delivering new poli uh, policy initiatives uh, or tweaking old ones, as we've done in uh, the past year. Um, and of course, uh, as mentioned, yes, the, the, the Parliament and the Council have already uh, chosen to in, uh, increase the budget for the um, the citizens equality rights and values pr uh, program uh, by launching over 900 million euros this is our way of showing uh, recognitions that we need to strengthen and support civil society organization at a time where their efforts uh, and insights are, are needed the most great thanks Priscilla and Adam let's let's turn to you your thoughts on this front um. Uh, I think when we are talking about civil society, we should uh, take into account two factors. The first one, what are the typical uh, possibilities of action by uh, civil society? Uh, and the second, you know, how uh, the landscape of NGOs uh, is shaped in contemporary Europe. When it comes to the typical methods, we have methods of monitoring of uh, activities of different state bodies, advocacy actions, strategic litigation, raising awareness. More or less, these are basically those methods at the disposal of, of different kinds of uh, NGOs, and they could be um, applicable in the context of fighting for um, uh, equality. Of course, what could be important in this context is also the role of, uh, for example, employers uh, or organization of employers, trade unions in terms of uh, promotion uh, of different values relating to equality, as well as uh, religion or church uh, organizations. But I think that we should remember that right now, uh, because of the politics of, uh, politics of identity, we observe in some parts of Europe at least, uh, a, a civil society which is very much uh, divided along the political lines. Uh, so there is one professor from Harvard University from the Center of European Studies, Professor Grzegorz Eckert, 
uh, who has published uh, an article um, in which he claimed that we observe so-called pillarization of the civil society, which means that civil society is like within pillars along the lines as major political parties in each and every state. So in case you have a, let's imagine you have a right wing or extreme right wing political parties, usually you also have civil society organizations there, which do not uh, follow the same ideals of equality and promotion uh, of uh, non-discrimination or, or diversity. Quite otherwise, they will promote uh, politics of uh, identity. They will, uh, they, will, they will become a little bit xenophobic, nationalistic, or even maybe uh, going even further uh, when it comes to some uh, ideals. And we observe it in different countries of Europe, but also we, we observe it uh, and we still observe it in the, in the United States. And I think during the presidentship uh, of Donald Trump, it was especially uh, visible. So the question is, you know, what to do with it? Uh, because on the one hand, uh, when we are talking about the European Union and in the context of the European Union, it is obvious to me that you must be on the side of European values. So you must be on the side of uh, protection of um, against discrimination and protection of uh, equality and diversity. So you cannot just have a, uh, the equal uh, approach to all different kinds of organizations, including those that are going to destroy those basic values of the European integration and, uh, and basic European values. But the problem is that some governments tend to follow footsteps of those, uh, let's say, uh, identity-related organizations. Uh, so they try, to, um, they try to support them. They try to be in line with their uh, argumentation uh, about different uh, issues. Um, so obviously, it increases uh, polarization. Uh, it increases polarization. It increases uh, a possibility to act for those uh, defenders of European values. And in my opinion, it is extremely important to, uh, to think about it, you know, how to protect those ones that are fighting for values of equality and non-discrimination, that are believing still in the value of the European integration and the value of the non-discrimination uh, principles, especially if they are targeted. And here we have some, uh, in my opinion, on the one hand, you know, I mentioned already strengthening institutions like equality bodies. But another element could be uh, support to the new initiative by the Commission, and I fully support this initiative, which is the legislation on uh, so-called slap litigation, strategic lawsuits against public participation. Uh, if you look into, let's say, Polish leaders of women's movement or LGBT movement uh, or refugee protection movement, they are targeted with different kinds of uh, strategic lawsuits against public participation and they need protection because they feel very much alone in that context. Second, what we need and what is extremely important is building transnational networks of support that NGOs uh, are supporting each other when they are in a given, uh, when they are dealing with a, a given issue. Uh, so uh, let's say disability organizations support each other with their uh, policies, understanding of the law, but also with some domestic uh, strategy. Uh, racial justice organizations cooperate with each other. LGBTI organizations cooperate with each other because it, it is not only giving you um, uh, a sense of, you know, getting some additional NGO skills, but it is important in terms of not feeling alone when you are attacking, uh, wh when you are taking this war uh, or your uh, fight uh, individually, uh, sometimes quite alone uh, in your domestic um, in the, your domestic sphere. But, but I would like to, uh, to add to this uh, just one additional component. You know, one of the problems we face uh, in my country is uh, adoption of very egregious, and, I, uh, and you know, I regret that I must tell you about this, uh, so-called resolutions of some local communities against so-called LGBT ideology. So it was, it was a little bit like the invention created by some right-wing NGOs in Poland in order to protect like the traditional notion of family. So they have uh, convinced some local communities in Eastern and Southern Poland to adopt resolutions against LGBT ideology. And uh, there were a number of actions taken concerning this, including the resolution by the European Parliament, which was referring to this indirectly. Uh, I, I took some actions as the Ombudsman. Uh, there were also some 
artistic and freedom of speech activities protesting against this. But you know, there is like one additional element which is, I think, not very well known, which is the bilateral relationship, not between states, but between particular cities. That uh, so, for example, if you are a partner city from France or Germany to the city in which, to the local community in which that kind of a resolution has been adopted, try to meet each other and try to talk about it. Why do you think it's simply wrong? Why uh, you shouldn't really in contemporary Europe adopt that kind of uh, uh, resolutions? Try to explain your uh, perspective, to look more uh, broadly uh, into this, uh, this issue. And I think that we are sometimes, you know, talking about those uh, strategies concerning organizations uh, that are located centrally in capital cities, in big cities, and we are forgetting that sometimes this change may just go with like the real meeting of the people who are coming just from different countries, but they have different perspectives of, uh, of thinking. You know, I remember that before Brexit, for example, Polish citizens uh, who were there as migrant workers were heavily discriminated by uh, by Brits uh, because of their origin. So they have a completely different perspective on the discrimination as they have right now in Poland, uh, in a country which is very much, uh, which is quite homogeneous uh, country from the point of view of um, or national, ethnic or religious uh, composition. So, so, so basically, uh, I, I think like creating this possibility of meeting the other and also establishing bilateral relations between different cities at the level of cities or local communities, that could be something interesting for the development of, uh, of some new strategies. Thank you. Great, Adam, it's, it's very nice to have your perspectives, A, as a lawyer, and uh, B, just speaking about intersectionality, which I wanna get into more uh, in another moment, because I think this is a great question of how we, how we kind of work in these intersectional ways. Um, and first, Alphias, I wanna talk to you a little bit. In your, in your testimony before the US Congress, uh, you spoke about how in terms of narrative, you don't want to be strictly anti things like anti racism, although of course you are. Uh, but but you've said that there's a need to frame DE and I work more frequently in positive terms in the context of what you stand for, rather than against. Um, so I'm curious, you know, how do you create this sort of positive narrative, even as the threat of the far right looms in some countries, uh, you know, or maybe maybe this looming threat makes this even more important. Yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and, and get the thoughts of the panel afterwards. So I think um, part of this positive narrative is bringing communities together. And I think this is what Adam said, and it's part of the intersectionality, is how can we work together as communities and have a wide tent approach where we build a new narrative, you know, a narrative away from division and hate, you know, um, and we, we, we educate people about, you know, history as well and what's happened so people can understand the situation of particular communities. But we can only remove these barriers um, if we come together and work together. And that includes in, in how we, we frame the discussion, right? So, for example, if you see a very popular movement that's been very successful is Fridays for the Future, which is very, very optimistic. I mean, in the sense that it's, you know, it's really clinging to people about, you know, our future and, you know, their grandchildren's future. And, you know, it brings people in that, you know, might have not been wanting to be involved. And so when we're talking about issues, at least when it comes to race, uh, I'm always in favor of trying to see how we can have a positive narrative. So, for example, when people talk about decolonizing the education system, I would be talking about actually how do we change that wording to maybe make it something a little bit more um, inclusive so can you know can we can we look at you know how do we expand the the curriculum right um so what we do is we're teaching about all parts of history because i think when you start using the words decolonizing and i do believe in the concept that we need to be decolonizing our education systems but i think the narrative we need to be using is something that is a bit more positive so you know expanding the curriculum um start, uh, language that won't you know put people off that might be supporters. Likewise, for example, when you see this, you know, defund the police. Um, and I really believe that we need to switch funding from, you know, uh, police to other services. When you have like domestic abuse or drugs uh, issues, I don't believe police should be going there. So I agree with the principle of defunding the police, 
but actually I, I would be saying, you know, uh, instead of defunding, maybe it's divert. So just to change that language, because what we're trying to do is actually uh, the point is right, but I think by using sometimes these words like defund or you know decolonizing, sometimes what we do is sometimes we might isolate people from the discussion. Um, so whilst agreeing completely with you know the idea of you know diverting funds from the police to other areas to better deal with domestic abuse and and for example people who are suffering with drug overdoses, but but. Less, I think the language needs to become a bit more positive. And the reason why I think it's very important is because, you know, the long term demographic needs uh, in Europe. Uh, Europe is changing, just like what we've seen happen in the US. We're becoming more multiracialized, we're becoming more diverse. Um, and also, you know, Europe will start to decline maybe in power because, you know, we have an aging population that, you know, which means that Europe will lack the economic power. I saw that the Gates Foundation produced a study saying that, you know, uh, by 2100, Nigeria, the top five countries and many EU countries would lose some power because of an aging population and a lack of taxpayers. So we will, we will need to have migration into Europe. But how do we make sure we maximize that so we can still have cohesive, strong societies? How can we ensure we have a high return on our investment in people? Um, you know, and so what we need to do is somehow create this new coalition. And I think that's where what we can see what happened in the US with President Biden's election is that, you know, we need to bring uh, racialized people, LGBTI people, people, you know, um, in, in poverty, uh, working class people all together in a wide tent approach. And the only way we can do that is if we start to look at a narrative and sort of change the narrative to something that is, is a bit more inclusive a bit more, you know, um, um, inclusive of everyone, but also, you know, the people who are our opponents, they will struggle to actually break down these arguments because how strong the, uh, the the narrative is, and you know, this is the this is how we can change. This is how we can overcome that polarization, um, you know. And if you look at what's happening with President Biden and his administration, they've understood the power of inclusion and benefits. And I would say also here, and I give the commission credit is that the commission is also trying to do that. Um, I, I see that from President von der Leyen, I see that from Commissioner Daly, but also this new office that is set up um, on diversity and inclusion with to, to improve the representation in the institutions. And you know, that is good steps forward in terms of how we can you know, build a more inclusive society, but also in terms of changing the narrative. And I think, and for racialized people, this is very, very important because, you know, I think when we see the institutions start to represent us, we will have automatically more trust. When I see Priscilla, for example, in the cabinet of the commissioner, it gives me great hope, but it gives others from my community hope that, you know, we can start to be involved. And I, one of the biggest things I see and the problems I see in my communities is that people just don't trust government mm -hmm. and they don't trust the institutions. It's because they don't see people like them and i think you know what we need to do is see how how we can use that representation you know that trust and actually say to people no these institutions actually work for you i'm a big big believer in government i really believe in the power of the state to harness everyone's potential and to achieve maximum efficiency so i see the state as a great enabler i see the biggest accelerators uh, for change coming from government together with civil society but i think we, to to do that we need to start seeing better representation so we can have more trust and also and i'll end here is the narrative needs to be led also by the state together with civil society and with business and others but we need to see that positive narrative um, which will then you know inspire others and get more people involved and i think at the commission level we're seeing that now from President President von der Leyen, from Commissioner Daly, the language is very, very good. It's it's very inclusion uh, focused language, and I think that is good. There are still some issues, and and we, we and I think we made them clear. But we're seeing good progress on these things. Great, nice. Thank you. I I love this idea. Of just you know, how do you in these in these really fraught conversations, how do you avoid you know, putting people immediately on the defensive? It, it's it's tough to do, especially when when these are topics that we care deeply about. Um, for so I'll turn to you. Alphaeus has said he's he's quite inspired seeing you. <laughs> and so uh, I'll let you you weigh in. Uh, you know this this idea of a positive narrative is it something you guys are grappling with internally? 
commission as well and, and thinking of new ways in which to do this. No, that was, um, thank you very much, <laughs> Alfie, for sure. Um, there's not much I can disagree with on that. Of course, narrative language is e extremely important when you're trying to um, uh, assess a, a situation, particularly such as racism and discrimination. But I think we also need to stay, take stock of where we are at in the discussion, which is extremely important. Um, for me, we can and we must always be anti-racism because it's the minimum standard uh, for the conversation on racial justice to progress. We're so early in that uh, discussion. Do I wish we were at the stage where we can um, speak the way Althias speaks at the moment? Yes, and I, I really do think that we will get there. This is why we have a um, anti-racism action plan. This is why we put that together. This is why we we have a um, anti-racism coordinator who's just been um, appointed. This is why we have this new team working on, on diversity. And yes, maybe the language um, at the time that we were putting this together is what our kids would say a, a bit more negative, but that's because we were, were at the forefront of this conversation. We want people to be actively uh, or to react actively when they see uh, racism and discrimination happen. So in, in that sense, we need the stronger language uh, at the moment, we, and I, I, I personally still think we, we need it still as an activist and as someone who uh, who's in the cabinet of uh, the Commissioner for Equality. I mean, going to the point on um, polarization, that, that is not new. Um, polarization is not new. The, um, uh, the issues that we have with the growing uh, uh, extremism and uh, uh, um, the right wing uh, moving in Europe. Those are, are not new phenomenons, but we're seeing them more and more at the forefront. Uh, and I don't think particularly identity politics uh, can, is always negative. And we've seen that with the Black Lives Matter movement. We've, we've seen that with uh, how the LGBTIQ movement has uh, put it together, its pride movement. We've seen how identity politics can be used to, to further good. Um, it, our concerns are, of course, when it's used to divide. Um, uh, and 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 this is this is where the the main issue is, and our fiesta has of, of course already mentioned that. But for us, and uh, as a cabinet uh, and as an institution, uh, diversity and inclusion are uh, two of the EU's mo most cherished values, and the EU and the EU institution must always uh, stand firmly when those uh, uh, values are being challenged, as Adam also uh, mentioned earlier. Unmuting. Wonderful. Great, Priscilla. And I just want to take this moment to to say we're we're still hoping Pirko will join us. We would love to have her uh, her thoughts, uh, particularly in her work uh, with disabilities in this community. I think it'd be really interesting to have her thoughts on uh, intersectionality as well, which we're going to get into shortly. Um, so I'll keep you guys posted. Uh, we're still hoping she can certainly join us at any time in this panel. Um, and Adam, uh, let's let's turn it over to you. I mean, you know, can we have uh, can we change this narrative? Can we kind of uh, talk in ways that are not necessarily anti, particularly, you know, I mean, a country like yours, we're seeing rolling back of women's rights, LGBTQ rights, um, you know, wh what's what's the role of this, uh, this kind of a po more of a positive narrative there? Is there one? You know, it's quite a difficult to, uh, to, to answer this question uh, from this perspective. Uh, of a country where uh, those values are subject of constant attack um, and uh, undermining. So uh, when you have a lot of negative narrative regarding, uh, in general, uh, non-discrimination principle and equality policies. Um, but uh, I think, you know, when you are living in this environment, uh, you start to think about some new strategies, new friends, new alliances, which is all, uh, always uh, good uh, because uh, it, uh, it mm, I think the problem is when you are taking uh, those values as granted. And I think in, uh, for many years uh, in, in my country and I think in, in general in Central and Eastern Europe, some of those values that were connected with equality and non-discrimination were treated as just something obvious because it is a part of the civilization, uh, civilizational change that was happening in a, uh, in a country. And we didn't, I think, uh, 
make uh, enough of uh, effort in order to fight for the real understanding why those values are uh, needed uh, and why diversity is important in your, uh, in your daily life. Uh, and it seems to me that the pressure coming from right-wing or nationalistic groups gives you this um, uh, additional understanding why you must do much more than expected, than, uh, than expected from you in order to fight for those values. And uh, I would like just to, to come back a little bit to one of the narratives which is, in my opinion, missing uh, in debates. It was mentioned uh, by Alfias uh, uh, in a short way, but, but I think we should come back to this. Um, I think the tragedy of the Second World War and the language of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Universal Declaration uh, and the concept of dignity and the concept of equality appeared as a result of barbaric acts during the Second World War because of Holocaust, because of uh, massive uh, dispersals and evictions of, of people, because of uh, genocides uh, and uh, really great tragedies in our, in our world. And, and you know, what happens is that, you know, right now we observe that kind of challenges also, you know, the practice of the International Criminal Court is a good example, you know, on a daily basis, uh, what, uh, what could be the result of hatred, where hatred leads to. Uh, and I think it is quite important, in my opinion, to connect uh, those uh, acts of violence that happen all in all different uh, parts of the world, which are subject of criminalization by domestic courts, by such tribunals like uh, ICC, and also our historical experiences coming from the Second World War, uh, coming from uh, Rwanda, uh, coming from uh, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, other countries, and just to give to the people, to the regular people, the understanding why you need to protect rights now, because it is uh, one of the ways uh, not to get into such trouble as it happened in the past. It also applies to LGBTI uh, protection. You know, quite often in my uh, speeches, I mentioned, for example, the tragedy of the LGBTI persons during the Second World War. They were also in concentration camps. Uh, there, there are books about this. There are memorial plates in, uh, in Berlin and in other places in the world concerning the, the fate of LGBTI uh, persons during the Second World War. We have the example of Alan Turing, uh, the, 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 the English genius who has been badly treated because of his sexual uh, orientation. So, Let's, in our narrative, let's try to look into the past, not to forget, not to treat uh, this whole discussion as just, you know, trying to find some new ways of understanding things. You know, if we look to the past, we might find quite easy answers to all different questions, you know, why we should take uh, about those values. But I think our role is to get true with this message to the young generation. Uh, because for them, talking about history is like another fairy tale. Um, so, for example, uh, I think like to going to all different places of, me of memory, of remembrance, is an important uh, step in order to build this awareness that those things really happened. And they are not just, you know, from the history handbooks, but they really, uh, they happened really on our uh, earth. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, if I, I know you, you'd like to weigh in as well. I'd also... Um, uh, I'm going to have you weigh in and then also to welcome Pirko because I, I think she's joined us. Um, and Pirko, you're welcome to, um, yeah, put on your on your camera and uh, and Mike. I'm not sure if if you're uh, hooked up yet, audio. <laughs> audio yes, wise. thank you very much, and uh, my deepest deepest apologies. The reminder mail was among a thousand spam messages for some reason. And I was, I was, I was completely, completely sort of mixing up the times. So my apologies to everyone. I'll put on the camera for a while. Don't, uh, don't be, uh, don't be alarmed. I'm, uh, I mean, I'm in full health, but, um, I need to I need to rest uh, rest a bit, so that's why I that's why I, my habits my outward look is not so well put now. 
but I'm very happy to be here and apologies for being so much late. And if you allow me to say also in in as a as a key message following from the last speaker that it is very, very important to recall that the whole horror of of the Holocaust started with people with intellectual disabilities in Germany. They were the first group to be tested on this idea whether the whether people would accept the eradication of some members of society. And that is always very important to keep in mind that disabled people together with other minorities are often those who are who are the first to be considered not not worth protecting anymore. Pirko, it's it's so good to have you here. I'm glad you could join us. Um, this is wonderful. And and I know that Adam uh, has has just said he has to uh, leave us at one for another meeting. So so we'll we'll miss him. Uh, and uh, thank you, thank and, you very much. Thank it's you. Been great no. having your thoughts. But thank I'm uh, glad now we have Pirko too to to weigh in. So thank you very much, Adam. Uh, great having you. Great to meet you. And uh, thank you for your insights. And I, I think this is a really nice time to get into um, questions of, of, we've spoken a little bit around inter, intersectional work in this field. And uh, certainly our work at Brussels Binder has been geared towards bringing more women into discussions as well as panels like this one. It's, it's also been a group that it, it's been pointed out is, is pretty white and middle-class. Uh, one of a number of groups who have who have a fair amount of work to do on on the intersectional front as well, um, and so I would love to hear what you guys are doing. And maybe Pirko, it's a nice it's a nice chance to start with you. I mean, um, this nexity be between diversity and you know, within the disability community too. Um, yeah, and and I'd love no, to. my camera my camera obviously doesn't want to show me to you. <laughs> Uh, I will send a picture. Right. We're happy to have your voice. I'm afraid no that worries. Yeah. my this camera is not now. Uh, probably it's the it's the intellectual. Uh, sorry, the artificial intelligence and it, it makes a judgment as to my as to my visibility. But anyways, I would like to very much thank you for that important work. And also highlighting the fact that we can do we can do intersectionality in a proper way that all, that enhances and strengthens all our work. That is what I think is crucial. That intersectionality is more than just the stereotypical, almost jokingly given answers where you just add upon a protected characteristic and end up with a very rare individual. And this is not what intersectionality is about. Intersectionality is about recognizing that we have multiple, we have many identities, we have many facets in our identities and we may be, may be discriminated uh, on the basis of, uh, of various grounds that interact and, uh, and also compound each other in a way that, that increases exclusion mm -hmm. and makes the discrimination even more difficult to combat. And uh, I'm particularly thinking about uh, disabled people who belong to any, any protected groups we have been only recently starting on the work of of reclaiming and bringing up um, bringing up minorities that might um, that may even be the silent minorities in many in many uh, even in many social movements. So it's. So it's very important that we have these discussions that, and that we come together to strengthen our resolve in fighting against discrimination, regardless 
of what the ground is that the discrimination happens upon. And I think it's very crucial at the, at the current moment we are living in. We are seeing too much of old prejudices rising again, uh, rising again in terms of in terms of even religious discrimination. So it's very important that we do this work together. And it's also important, I think, more important that we that we can clearly show together that it's efficient and it and it um, somehow uh, and it makes the work against discrimination and for a better, more equal Europe makes that work even more efficient if we are working together. And that for me is the is the most important part of intersectional work that we learn from each other's experiences. We learn from the realities of daily life, what kind of barriers people face, uh, attitudinal, psychological, even physical barriers for entry into, into society. I just read before this, a very sad news from the European Court, from the European Court of Human Rights, which tended to say that not all disabled people are eligible to vote. And that is something that we must keep in mind that all of these discriminations and exclusions that happen in society, they take away our agency, our our ability to advocate for ourselves and for our peers and also for our colleagues who are facing different discriminations. Oh. Pierco, thank you. That, that's given us a lot to talk about. I mean, I, I think Afeas also, this is something that you've really spoken about. I know in your testimony before Congress, uh, it was also a topic. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on what Pirko just said and how how you're working in this realm as well. Thank you very much. Can you can you hear me okay? Because I'm I think I'm having some issues with my internet connection. Yeah, uh, it's okay. I, I can hear you well. Perfect. Um, so I just probably want to just go a little bit uh, back to the conversation we're having uh, before, and then to come to what Pirko was saying, but in the same vein. Um, I think when it comes to history, we, we need to also do more to educate people about the different histories. So I think in Europe, you know, because of World War II, it's been the predominant, predominant discussion when it comes to history. But actually, part of challenging uh, some of the prejudices we have is also to understand Europe's history with racialized communities, Europe's history with people with disabilities, Europe's history with um, LGBTI um, uh, discrimination. And so I think what's very important, like for example, when it came to racialized people, our civil rights movement actually happened in our homelands, you know, which were which were colonized. And, you know, our, our communities had to, you know, push back against, you know, the, the colonizers. And so it's important that people understand, you know, our history so they can better understand our situation today. And so I think it's really important to make sure that our teaching of history is, is diverse. And, you know, our remembrance of history is also equal. We need to be equal in our, in our remembrance of history. Um, and I see that also with the Holocaust, for example, that, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, every time we have Holocaust Remembrance Days that we folk, we, we make sure we comm commemorate all of the victims of the of the Holocaust. Um, so you know that way there, there is no doubt for anyone um, that Europe is a truly uh, inclusive union. You know, and I think so. We just have to make sure that when we're talking about history, that we always are for always bringing up everyone's history and better understanding everyone's history. And in terms of the narrative, I would just say one thing I really liked that the Commission done recently was the, um, the latest strategy on anti-Semitism. It said, you know, combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life. That end, fostering Jewish life, that is so powerful. Uh, but I understand it's a bit more difficult to do maybe um, uh, in regards to Muslims or maybe to, to, to Black people because there might be more of a political pushback. But, you know, 
it's so powerful. Imagine we had strategies that said, you know, fostering, you know, Muslim life in Europe. Um, I, I could imagine the outcry that will come from the member states, but just that language is so mm -hmm. strong that it can really help. And now in terms of intersectionality, I think Firko said everything. I think, you know, there were, we have to remember the way the, the phrase was coined, right? So, you know, the, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, a black lesbian woman, you know, who identified correctly that, you know, women have different challenges, black women have different challenges, and then black lesbian women have different challenges. And unfortunately, I think the term has now become uh, used, but people have lost the original meaning of it. And I think that the, the reason why I believe so strongly in, inter in intersectionality, and we produced a report last week um, that goes to it, is that it it can really, really help all communities. If we're really serious about, you know, um, unity in diversity and equality for all, then our best option is going down the path of intersectionality. Now, again, I, I keep on referencing France, but I saw in the Senate maybe two weeks ago that, you know, there was this whole, um, there, was a, there was a discussion around, um, you know, um, intersectionality and it being a threat. Uh, but actually, I think that's what happens. When you get intersectionality right, it's when the institutions start to worry about it. And actually that, because when we mobilize groups that come together, so, you know, people with disabilities, um, um, working class, you know, people, um, advocates, um, anti-racist advocates, you bring them together, you suddenly create a huge uh, movement. Um, and, you know, um, and that's what we saw that's happening in the US, but it's also happening at a local level in Europe. And, you know, that's the best way we can work because for me, if we want to talk about gender equality, then it can only come when we have racial justice. If you want to have racial justice, it can only come when you have um, justice for people with disabilities. And so, you know, I always say it in my community that when it comes to racial justice, that we've got to make sure that we're always centering the voices of the ones that are at the margins. So, you know, trans uh, racialized people, you know, Muslim women, um, and so, and, and black women, and, you know, asy female asylum seekers, we need to always center, and that is how we will slowly build that solidarity and bring different groups together, and it really helps, because maybe one group has more political support, and if they can bring the other groups in somehow through intersectionality, it can help those other groups that are, you know, really at the margins and really facing discrimination. And, and I give you one example here where you see the overlap is like when Pirko talks about, you know, the European Court of Human Rights decision, you know, voter suppression is a very big thing for racialized communities here in Europe. So you see already the links between our movements that we face a lot of the similar challenges but what sometimes we lack is coming together. And I think, you know, we need to see how we can come together. And that's why I also appreciate Brussels Binder that, you know, today you show that. You show, you know, whether it's through me and Perco and also Priscilla, that diversity is there, but you show that support and solidarity by having us here and giving us that platform to speak. And, you know, this is the way we need to be moving forward. And I will make a vow, and I've always made this vow, that we're not equal to, none of us are equal until we're all equal. And so therefore, for me in my advocacy, my advocacy is equally as important for me to, to achieve racial justice as it is to achieve you know, justice for people with disabilities. And you know, my work is not, won't end um, with, my, with my communities getting justice. It's about every community getting justice. Oh, thank you. I, I am so enjoying this conversation. Um, and, and now, Priscilla, I'd like to turn to you, get your thoughts on, on the work you guys are doing in the intersectional realm. And then after Priscilla talks, we have an audience question. So I'll, I'll get to that afterwards. I mean, what can I honestly add to, to what uh, Pierco and, and Al Alfias have said? They've really um, encompassed this, this issue in, in, in the best light. Um, maybe then I will go into how I've seen um, intersectionality within the commission and within our cabinet. Um, the very first event that I worked um, with the commissioner on was on intersectionality. And the very first line of that speech was, intersectionality is more than a buzzword. We have to be go beyond uh, the word and its popularity uh, at the moment. It's the cornerstone, it became the cornerstone to all of our strategies going forward. So the, from the gender equality strategy to the anti-racism action plan to the LGBTIQ um, 
strategy to the Roma strategic framework and going forward. Um, so in that sense, really looking at the experience, for instance, me, uh, a black woman from a low income background, how does my experience um, differ from that of a white man from a Roma background with a disability? Uh, and how the different elements of our identity mean that we see uh, discrimination um, and intolerance in all different ways. Uh, but then go beyond just our union of equality strategies, we also have the Task Force for Equality, who then looks at all uh, European uh, Commission policies from trade to food safety to the environment uh, to fisheries, uh, all of, the, um, of uh, our policies and see how e equality and intersectionality is embedded in that. And we, we, we do this on a weekly basis to see how we can um, influence all of those policies uh, too. So I think um, there's not much more I can really add uh, to that on, on what we're doing, but intersectionality is really the core of, of our work as a union of equality. Great. Priscilla, thank you very much. Um, and, and so let's get to our question. Uh, now, this is from Fardia Hussein. Uh, please forgive me if I, if I have not done a good pronunciation there. Um, and she weighs and she said she's super happy uh, that the commission and the institutions are actively engaged uh, to be a better reflection of all EU citizens. Uh, however, she says we're far from there. Um, and the Human Rights Office itself does not represent society um, as it should be, um, although the language is becoming more inclusive. Um, but, but both internal and external communication, she feels, needs to needs uh, improvement. So, um, she said we have more instruments at hand, but we need more courage to implement these. So she wants to know uh, what do you think we, as average staff, um, uh, within the organization, so not those in power, but but staffers uh, can do to move forward uh, to bring about the 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 cause of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So those kind of working within the system, and hopefully I've I've uh, done justice to to your question, and uh, I'll let the panelists take over. I'm happy for you to go first, Priscilla, because you're you're part of the internal staff, so. <laughs> No, I, I mean, I, I, I really like this question. It's, it's, it's a tough question to, to, to take on, um, particularly, you know, as someone who works uh, in, in the commission itself, I just have to walk outside the door and um, count how many people who look like me. Uh, and trust me, I, I probably won't uh, fill one hand. So yes, of course, um, uh, we're better reflecting the, the, the discussion but we're a long way from really reflecting uh, EU's diversity within the institution itself. And I'm, I'm sure also in, um, in business and, and in civil society, this is uh, a conversation that is uh, gaining more and more traction, um, at least from the, the commission side, this conversation is becoming even more concrete in terms of uh, us looking at ways to uh, to see how we can address the lack of diversity within our own institution. So not just simply putting these words in um, strategies, in communications on how um, things should be better outside, but looking at how we as an institution can, can lead this discussion by showing how we can do better within our own uh, house. Um, in terms of um, uh, regular staff, that is, yeah, it's, it's extremely difficult to to, to answer, it really depends on the mechanisms that you have within um, your institution. I know that within um, mine, as someone who is uh, in herself very, very vocal, uh, seeing the lack of diversity, uh, I, you know, asking questions, seeing if there are surveys, uh, seeing if there's trainings for higher um, for senior staff to to know more about diversity to learn more about what they can do about being more inclusive um these are things that maybe are in your institutions already but i wanted to make the point of what we're actually doing in the commission in terms of uh addressing this in, uh, this issue from uh, our own house great priscilla thank you and pirko would you like to add anything on this front Yes, please. I was I was trying to even write to the chat, but uh, I just wanted to highlight one example of this 
uh, in a very practical way, uh, the European Parliament has this stagiaire program. And within that stagiaire program, they particularly welcome uh, stagiaires with disabilities. And I find that very encouraging and very important so that the young people get the experience and get the get the get the uh, get the encouragement that they can also be part of the European of the European uh, network of uh, of uh, of how would I say uh, authorities. Um, uh, particularly the stagiaire programs are important because they are the sort of entry level, uh, entry level coming in, getting to know the institutions and gathering valuable, uh, valuable experience for, for future careers. And also I know that EPSO, the selection office has done a lot of work to improve accessibility of of uh, the concours, the the competitions for for European authorities. So so that is important. I think as a practical example that you can show that you have that you have the opportunity to be part of that community. Wonderful, Pierco. Thank you. These are great thoughts and uh, we're it's rapidly uh, coming coming to the end of our time. So I wanna make sure we get in a question about practical solutions um, and really, you know, good good things that you guys are seeing, I, um, you know, as, as people working in the trenches of DE&I uh, in terms of these best practices, you know, what, what are some of the most encouraging things you guys are seeing, whether out of your own organizations or elsewhere, um, you know, good work that, that has impressed you and really made you think, okay, here, now this is something we can build on. And maybe this is something members in our audience can build on as well. Yeah, maybe I can come in here. Yeah. Um, also, maybe I have a, a, a response to the, the previous question as well. I, I think, um, I do think that the best practice we're seeing right now is, you know, what's happened um, in terms of the way we responded to COVID at different levels. And I think that, you know, seeing how um, at local level, especially with COVID that, you know, the situation varies from, from one city to another. You know, you saw that in Italy at the beginning of the crisis that, you know, one, one particular city or, or area was affected more than the others. And so what, what we're seeing is more and more positive development at, uh, at a, a very, at, a, at the local level. Um, and where we're seeing actually at a local level, you see more involvement of civil society and more voices from civil society. So actually I'm seeing a lot of positive development there in terms of how local change is happening. And I once had a very good uh, podcast on uh, that GMF done on this or a discussion, uh, not to plug GMF, but to say that there was a very good discussion on this, but a lot of good works happening at the local level. And we need to see how we can accelerate that. I think part of the problem at the European level is issues around access issues around funding, um, the civil society model. We, we produced our first report where we said we need a new relationship with civil society, the institutions. But the, what we need to also see is we need to challenge this orthodoxy of the civil society model. So right now we gravitate to big organizations with big funds and you know we can apply for big uh, fund proposals. But what we need to see is how we can actually go beyond that. How can we reach out to organizations that are smaller, um, organizations that probably, probably aren't as well resourced? Um, how can we bring them in the discussion? I think there's a lot still to do there. So we need to see how we can target those barriers. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot of, and I think the other positive thing I would say is that, you know, I just see that what happened with Black Lives Matter and, and, and it took the killing of George Floyd um, and an eight minute video, but you know, um, 20 years ago, we don't have been able to make that video. So the police could do whatever they want. Now, because of social media, we can organize, we can strategize, we can come together. Social media also has a lot of bad things and we've seen this as, 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 as racialized people, but it's power to convene and bring us together. Someone took a video of that police officer kneeling and that video went viral. And suddenly we see in Europe that this response from the commission, we're seeing it conversations and we're seeing a younger generation um, that is is, is, is is in tune to this. 
And so I think what we need to do is how do we harness that support from the younger people into political votes? Because I yeah. think what we're seeing is that the political vote is still being monopolized by an older demographic. Um, and I think that actually, if you see, there is a strong support for Black Lives Matter and, and inclusion. But, you know, it's just that we're not harnessing that support into political votes. And I think that's what we have to do at a grassroots level to organize better in our communities, to get more people into, into uh, the election system. And sorry, I know I, I'll try to finish this in, in one minute, but I have something to say about um, the average worker in institutions. You can't imagine how difficult it is for, for racialized people here I talk about, but as, as, a, as a gay man, as a Muslim man, as a, as a person, as a racialized person, it is very, very difficult in the European institutions um, to be the only one at times. And you know, you, when you make a complaint, people don't take it seriously. They're just kind of uh, indifferent to it. And I, I see a colleague um, uh, who's in, who's one of the participants, I don't want to name her, who's had a horrible time in the institutions because you know, every time she's complained, it's been belittled and you know, minimized. And I can't tell you how much that can affect people. You know, because of our prejudices, we're pushing away talent, we're pushing away knowledge. Um, if you look at in the foreign service, you know, how great would it be to have a foreign service that has all of Europe's equal uh, diversity? So when we go out to missions, uh, to, to country delegations, we can be better diplomats because we might have a better understanding of the dynamics in those cultures. But because of our prejudices, and I, I have this one case of my, my friend who, let's say, is in, is in an average level position, she's been she's been completely let down by the institutions. And you know, as a, as a black woman, we, we need to understand that the institutions still have a long way to go. So part of it is having this new office of representation, but how do we also create a safe space? I think we still haven't yeah. figured out that yet. How do we make sure these institutions are safe spaces for people with disabilities, um, racialized people, LGBTIQ people, this, this new survey will help. But how can we make sure that the institutions are um, safe spaces because it's great to have representation and of course once we have more representation we'll be more in numbers so we can you know push back a little bit more where we see racism but right now in this transition where we still got some time how can we make sure that the institutions are safe spaces because I don't want what's happened to my friend happen to someone else and I'll just end here is that I'm speaking from a very privileged position I think Priscilla as well being in the cabinet I worked for an MEP but I think that the civil servants who, are, who maybe don't have that same level or the support of an MEP, we need to see how we can better protect them because they, they are being let down. Thank you for that for those remarks. That it's just really great food for thought. And and so now I want to bring in just a couple more voices from our audience, and then I want to get to Priscilla and Perku, so maybe they can kind of. Uh, um, Let's see, jump off of what some of our audience members are saying and also give their own thoughts on, on good works uh, that's, that's going on in the trenches here. So we have from audience member Dory Wilson, she says as an employee of the commission, she'd like to understand why the diversity and inclusion office seems to have no one of color on their team. Um, so we have a question from Amori Duncan, and she's saying, what impact would be made if EU institutions, civil society, and the private sector hired more people that were not like them and had different perspective in life? You know, would this help in the decision-making pro uh, process? Um, and, and finally, Carrie Thompson asks, uh, you know, how can we distinguish between positive discrimination and affirmative action? So it's a lot to unpack in four minutes and counting. And <laughs> Uh, so, Priscilla, I'll I'll uh, I'll let you jump in here. You can talk about good work you're seeing in the trenches. Anything you'd like to add to our wonderful right. audience member comments, and then and then Pirku will give you the closing words. And we're so happy you could join us here. Okay. Um, yeah. Small task. Small task. Um, <laughs> okay. So yeah, maybe to start with um, some of the good work that I'm seeing. Um, you know, Alpheus has touched on a lot that I that I wanted to say. I think we've um, I mean, we've known each other for a long time, but we've been in the same bubble um, for for a long time. I arrived in Brussels five years ago um, as um, someone from a minority background, a low income background, whose parents have absolutely no idea what the EU is and what it does. Uh, arriving in Brussels in order to work on policies uh, to, to impact the lives of people who look like me, and at the time having discussions or the lack of this discussions uh, because there were other things that were more of priority 
or these issues were not things that we spoke about uh, at least five years ago. So what I would say is that in the past five years, it's been an impressive appetite to take on these dis difficult discussions um, and to tackle them. And of course, within the last year in specifically, and yes, you know, as, as uh, Alfie has, has mentioned, it took um, for a man to lose his life for the, for the whole world to actually say, okay, we really need to uh, take this very, very seriously um, and put actions together to, to, to stop uh, things like this happening. Um, not, not exactly what should spur uh, change, but it most certainly has. Uh, I also think the um, uh, the way civil society has mobilized around these issues, whether it is Black Lives Matter or uh, the negative impacts uh, that COVID has had, particularly on people of minority backgrounds, um, these things have made uh, institutions uh, stand up and, and, and take in uh, and, and on board uh, the comments being made and address them. Um, some of the other comments, now I have to look back and see uh, what else I can um, uh, comment on. On the diverse and, diversity and inclusion office, yes, uh, I mean, that representation is important. I, I, I strongly believe that I'm someone who uh, hopefully uh, in, in encompasses that too. Uh, our anti-racism coordinator, who would be the key person working on this, is from a minority background. She'll be leading the work on this. Uh, someone who's extremely well respected within uh, the anti-racism uh, civil society um, sphere. Uh, and, and, you know, for, for that reason, I think that we've done a very, very good job in terms of turning this around within uh, a few months to get someone into a position to uh, take on the work that this anti-racism action plan has uh, landed on her lap, which is huge. Um, and then the final comment, can you remind me <laughs> what the last comment was so I can just make a quick... Um... It, uh, it involved, is there a way to distinguish between positive discrimination and affirmative action from Carrie? Sure. Yeah, um, honestly, <laughs> I, I don't, I really don't know how to, 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 to put that into words because I mean, it, there is probably an opinion that I have personally and an opinion that um, could or could not work for the institution. So I probably will leave that one. <laughs> a, whole, a whole panel in itself, I think. Well, <sighs> thank you, Priscilla. And Pierco, please, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts too on good work you're seeing in this field. And um, we'll let you have, have the closing remarks. And, and I think I think this is it. This is it that we come together and we discuss this. And I was, I was very empowered and excited to hear that there is now an anti-racism coordinator within the within the services. It's long overdue, uh, but also I would, if I if I uh, if I would sort of look forward, what we could do more together is that we could we could more and more focus on the fact that the that the that the staff of the institutions would become more and more diverse, also in terms of age, uh, and uh, in order to be an accommodating and uh, fully reflecting the diversity of the European nations, I think that would be important. Um, I would also like very much to have a some kind of continuation of the of the efforts that the various uh, various uh, institutions have started in terms of to bring in more more minority people or giving the chance or lowering the barriers to the service for those who are interested, but also how to how to lower the barriers for the dialogue between the institutions and the representatives of the civil society. We are very worried at the moment of the shrinking space of civil society and some negative um, negative sort of pushback that we are having, for example, in the issue around women's rights and reproductive health, for example. So we have to be always aware that what we've achieved is not taken, is not to be taken for granted. And although we now have this moment, uh, this very tragic, following a very tragic event uh, in the, in that sparked the Black Lives 
uh, matter movement, I think we have to we have to take hold of this opportunity and this time to bring up this this discussion within the institutions and also how to improve the ways to have a dialogue with the civil society and how to collect how to collect uh, opinions and knowledge from different spheres of society. I think that the European institutions are, are already doing something, but we need to encourage them to do even more and even more together with the civil society. Thank you. Yoko, thank you so much. Priscilla, thank you so much. Alpheus, thank you so much. It's uh, I, I feel privileged to have uh, been uh, the moderator for this wonderful panel. I think it was a great discussion. We were having uh, a lot of audience participation at the end. It's the kind of topic I, I could talk about for another couple of hours. Um, but unfortunately, we have to end it here. Um, yeah. Wonderful. And uh, and hopefully it's a conversation that will continue. Thank you to the German Marshall Fund. Thank you to Brussels Binder Beyond for all of its uh, wonderful work. And uh, I'm excited for the series of discussions that will be taking place around uh, their good work this week. So uh, thank you all. Uh, yeah. Thank and you indeed. Thanks members for joining us. And if you, if you would allow me very quickly a lawyer's answer is that affirmative action and positive discrimination are exactly the same thing from different jurisdictions. So I wouldn't pass a difference, but they are to promote uh, diversity and equality. So they are good things. Oh, good. Thank you. Them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And if I didn't answer any um, specific questions, please. Um, get into contact with me. I'm happy to uh, answer that by email or however. Oh, that's a really nice offer uh, from our wonderful yep. panel. Thanks you guys so much for this. Thank you. Good, and good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.